Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. We're living in the middle of what I would describe as a pandemic, a banking crisis around the world for the past 35 years or so. Only about 29% of countries around the world have managed to avoid a major banking crisis during that time, and some have had more than one. The United States, for example, has had two major crises during that period. I want to emphasize that that's quite unusual. So why are these banking crises happening? The standard view among economists is two things. First, banks are inherently fragile. They hold on their asset side opaque assets, assets that can be hard for outsiders to value. And they finance those assets acquisition with short-term liabilities. And if there is a big shock that happens, that big shock about, uh, that can raise questions about the value of those assets leads people to be concerned that banks might not be able to meet their payments. They might withdraw the debts from the banks. In anticipation of that, the banks themselves might decide to stop lending and start trying to accumulate cash. So you get the picture. Now, the problem with this is that it's, it's not going to be a sufficient answer to the question. And the reason it isn't a sufficient answer is because the frequency of banking crises differs across time and across space. And in fact, and we're currently living through a pandemic of banking crises. But other times, let's take, for example, the period 1874 to 1913 is one in which the inherent sort of volatility of the GDP in the world was actually greater than it is today. And yet, during that time, we had very few banking crises. So it can't really be that big shocks combined with the inherent nature of banks explain crises because they're so much more common today. Furthermore, some countries, even when they experience very big shocks, and even though they may have very uh, uh, lively banking systems, that is, banking systems that are providing a very large amount of credit, may be able to avoid crises while others that are providing similar amounts of credit or maybe even less amounts of credit on average over time might experience much more. And the, the comparison that I've got here to describe today is between Canada and the United States. So Canada is a country that experienced zero banking crises from the beginning of its, uh, the origins of its banking system till today. The US has experienced 17. Yet the Canadian banking system has actually produced more credit on average relative to GDP than the US has during that period. Canada, of course, is a primary commodity exporting economy, and its GDP has been much more volatile over time than the US. So what's the other missing element in the story that can explain this frequency and severity of banking crises in some countries relative to others? Is it regulation? And I would say, yes, there's a lot of economic evidence that different countries and at different times, the same country, changes in regulation have mattered a lot for making the banking system relatively fragile. The most important regulatory change has been the tendency to protect banks. The more banks are protected with deposit insurance or other kinds of uh, bailout policies, the more they seem to get into trouble. If you're protected, then you feel that you can take a little bit more risk. And it's the combination of protection with inadequate prudential regulations. When those two things are combined, they do seem to account for uh, some of the difference over time and across countries that's observed. But then that just begs another question, which is, well, why do some countries seem to consistently combine protection with inadequate <laughs> regulation? while other countries seem to be able to avoid the problem. And so our answer is that if you're looking for the reason behind regulatory differences in countries, you have to look at the politics. That's where regulation comes from. When the political environment is such that it's easy 
for political groups to form, coalitions of different people to form, to find a way to use the banking system regulation as a means to channel resources from some groups in the population to others. That is, some factions find a way to make the banking system favor them at the expense of others, that that seems to be the sort of underlying common denominator of banking systems that are dysfunctional. That is, both that, that tend to provide less credit and tend to be more unstable. Banking systems can be particularly attractive as these kinds of tax and transfer devices because it can often be very hard for people to see exactly how, unlike on budget government expenditure, it can be very hard to see exactly who's being favored and who's being taxed. That is, who's being disadvantaged and who's being advantaged by the, the system. We call the political process of bargaining and the, these formations of coalitions that control banking system outcomes, we call that the game of bank bargains. Now, the way that game is played varies, of course, across different countries, especially it's very different within democracies than it is within autocracies. But that's, uh, no matter how different the game is played, that's the common denominator of problems. What about credit scarcity? The strange thing is that even though the basics of commercial banking were all in place by the middle of the 18th century, most of which having been invented in Scotland prior to that time, and I think we, we would agree that they're not rocket science. Nevertheless, most countries in the world still have not managed to imitate that. That is, we still are in a world characterized by scarce credit, by a scarcity of basic commercial banking practice. And we point out that that deficiency in banking is explained similarly by political factors. So that this gives you a little bit of a sense of the ratio of private credit to GDP and how much it varies across countries. But you can see the enormous variation in the ratio of credit to GDP with a country like the UK at about one and a half times GDP in private credit, whereas a country like uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo with essentially zero credit relative to GDP. Now, I, some of you laughed and you probably thought, well, they're not surprised that countries that are so uh, war-torn and uh, having extreme governance problems are going to have a hard time constructing a banking system. And I think that's exactly right. But the thing is that one has to generalize a bit from that and understand that it's more generally the case that political uh, problems or political deficiencies are at the very heart of banking system problems and banking system deficiencies. We take very seriously the idea that banking system design reflects implicit partnerships between governments and private actors. And we take very seriously the way that this uh, game of bank bargains is organized. We try to understand it. It certainly is a fundamental in the sense that it is what determines entry into banking, who gets to be a banker, what the banks get to do, how competitive the banking system will be, who is going to be, have favored access to credit, and when losses occur, how are those losses going to be allocated? Governments often choose what we could describe as bad rules of this game, that is, rules that produce inefficient outcomes, inadequate credit, unstable credit. But they do so not because they're trying to create problems per se, but because the interests of the groups that are in charge are actually served by creating systems that are unstable and that provide inadequate credit on, to the rest of the population. They are the six countries that have managed to have fairly abundant credit and avoid crises for the past 40 years. What they have in common is that they are either, in the top three countries, city or island states. What do city or island states have in common? They tend to be places where it's very hard to create wedges within the population. So a lot, for example, in the US's history, a lot of the division in these um, coalition formations that have occurred is between urban and rural groups. Um, it's not something you're going to see in an island or city state. So the first thing to notice is those, the first group are countries that are small and politically homogeneous. The last three, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, especially Canada and New Zealand, are countries that have a tradition 
of anti-populist constitutions. That is, constitutions that make it very hard for factions to form to control the outcome in the banking system at the expense of others, at the expense of the broader economy. So our, our, our conclusions end up being at the level of successful banking systems having a lot to do with successful constitutions. Where do those successful constitutions come from is yet another question, and I'll, I'll try to give a hint or two about that. But before I move on to that, of course, on the other side of the coin, countries that have very scarce credit and very high frequency of crises are listed here. There's a list of the two, the a category of especially high crisis propensity and especially low credit, which is just Chad and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But then if you make a slightly larger, more sort of forgiving definition of, of those two things, you get a larger list. But you can see these are countries that are mainly autocracies and also countries that tend to be those that have had a history of poor governance problems. But what about the United States? Why is the United States in the list of countries that has had two major crises recently and 17 over its history? And that brings us to, to this point, which is, while it's true that de democracies tend to do better than autocracies on average, being a democracy is not per se a solution to endemic banking crises because some democracies have constitutions that have been much more permissive of the formation of factions that get control of the banking system to produce unstable outcomes at the expense of the general economic good. This gives you a sense of the difference between Canadian and US credit relative to GDP. You can see that Canada and the US tr have tracked each other pretty closely, but not in the recent period. Canada has managed to outstrip the US, so both in terms of stability and in terms of credit access in the banking system. What's producing these country differences? Why are democracies generally doing better? Why do some democracies do better than others? And through what mechanisms, how do these political coalitions actually form and produce these outcomes in bank regulation? There's really no way to avoid politics in banking. Um, for people to participate in banking, as sources of funding supply for banks, whether they're majority shareholders, minority shareholders, or depositors. If they have to feel confident about these three different problems that they might face that might lead them to lose their money, to have their money expropriated. Their money could be expropriated by the government. In autocracies, this is quite frequent. Depositors and minority shareholders find that their money could be expropriated by the management of the bank, who tend to be the majority shareholder in many countries. Or majority shareholders, depositors, and minority shareholders could find that they're expropriated by debtors. That happens in populist democracies, where uh, people who've borrowed from the bank, who can't repay their loans, go to the political process to appeal for protection so that they don't have to repay, of course, at the expense of those who've funded the bank. And so if you're giving money to a bank, you are very concerned about all of these potential risks. And of course, the way that those get uh, resolved is either the risks are mitigated or you have to be compensated for bearing those risks. The government, of course, is in charge of setting the rules that deal with each of those risks, but the government is an inherently conflicted party. It simultaneously borrows from banks and regulates them. It enforces debt contracts, but it needs the political support of the debtors. It distributes losses but it also needs the political support of depositors. So you get the idea that the, there's just no way of getting politics out of the banking system. And those participation constraints, the fact that you need to attract people to the banking system, but the inherent risks that have a political origin are going to be at the heart of our explanation of bank fragility. So we've tried to figure out how the game of bank bargains is played in these different political regimes, and then tried to explain how that logic of bargaining tends to produce predictable deficiencies in outcomes. One thing, as long as we're here in London, talk a little bit about the early differences between England and Scotland. Most of what's interesting about commercial banking was invented in Scotland by the middle of the 18th century, and the Scottish banking system was an extremely financially abundant environment and also a very stable one. 
in contrast to England and Wales. The key difference being that England and Wales had a single bank that was chartered, namely the Bank of England, and then limited size bank partnerships that were allowed to operate. From 1694 till 1826, there were no other chartered banks in England and Wales, while Scotland had numerous chartered banks and operating with branch networks uh, quite successfully. That's a little strange, because they had the same sovereign. They were operating here on the same island, and yet they had two completely different banking systems. And the essential answer to that, that we say, is war. English banking uh, served the purpose of financing the sovereign's war needs. The reason why private credit wasn't allowed to flourish in England and Wales was because credit was needed for the sovereign's war financing. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which brought that long period of war with France to an end, that was the beginning of the discussions that led to the liberalization, first in 1826, then in 1833, and subsequently. And by the 1840s, basically, the banking systems of Scotland and England are starting to look quite similar. But you could never understand why those banking systems were so different for so long if you didn't understand what we call the iron law of credit supply, which is there's only a chance that banks will provide credit to the private sector after the survival of the state has been insured. And so the survival of the state, after all, the state's in control of banking. It's not going to produce a banking system set of rules that are inconsistent with its own survival. And so that's a, one example of the principles that guide the game of bank bargains. If you thought that Britain had a very robust banking system throughout its history, you were wrong. From about World War I until through the 1970s, the British banking system was moribund. And in fact, you can see here that the German banking system, in terms of credit relative to GDP, was far in excess of the British. But look what happened during the Big Bang in the mid-1980s. Within five years, the credit to GDP ratio in the UK tripled. And then over subsequent years, it doubled again. So that the current status of London as a world financial center and the abundance of credit that Britain enjoys today is actually a fairly recent phenomenon um, that was not true for most of the 20th century. The United States is the quintessential populist banking story, very unstable banking. And the key sort of problem has been that the banking system has been used to achieve favored outcomes for particular subsets of the population. A very important message here is, I know that we like to blame bankers for just about everything, but bankers can't do it by themselves. They can't create this kind of trouble all on their own. During the period from about 1820 until 1980, it was an alliance of rural populist landowners and small unit bankers that were the main sort of stable alliance, political alliance in the United States that gave us a disastrous banking system, a banking system of tens of thousands of banks, none of which was allowed to branch, none of which could operate, that is, except one office in one location. What was the point of, of having a banking system like that? Well, it did give local monopoly power to banks because it was very hard for competition to happen locally in an environment that was structured that way. But it also benefited uh, rural landowners because they had banks that they felt were fairly closely tied to their particular economic interests. That is, the bankers, because they were local, didn't have as many options to lend outside of their local economy. As population shifted and as a, the banking crisis of the 1980s created large costs for the resolution of banks, Government policy finally shifted toward a banking system like that of every other country in the world, nationwide branch banking. But now you had a new opportunity, which was to determine who would be able to run those new nationwide branch banks that were being formed in the 1980s and the 1990s. And that created um, an opportunity for urban activist groups, a new kind of populism, no longer the rural populism of the prior era, but now an urban populism. And those groups were able to effectively use the political process to require that banks engaged in mergers had to pay urban activist groups 
very large sums of money in order to win per political permission to engage in those mergers. $867 billion was committed contractually to get the support of urban activist groups at merger hearings to favor the creation of these mega banks. And the mega banks were created, of course, to make money. They weren't going to give wonderful contracts to urban activist groups if they uh, didn't have some way of paying for those. And so the deal, of course, was if you're willing to make these kinds of loans, you're going to get some privileges in exchange. But the privileges basically were that if you were willing to make these loans, then you would also be able to hold very thin equity capital ratios, very little in, in terms of loss absorption capacity alongside those loans. In other words, the political bargain was, let's create a lot of risky assets and let's simultaneously have very little in capital buffers to absorb losses for those assets. The, economically, that's completely illogical. Politically, that makes perfect sense because otherwise you wouldn't have gotten such a great bargain between those two groups. Canada avoided this because it managed to set up a constitutional system that throughout this whole period that we we're describing of US fragility, managed to resist populist pressures to use the banking system as a tool for extracting resources for these particular factions. And I will uh, end with this last slide, giving you some basic conclusions and uh, open it up for further comments. The European banks are still pretty much in a, in a crisis situation yes. uh, since 2007. And there, there's all sorts of talk about how you manage bank regulation across a number of different sovereign states. What, what does your analysis, your approach to understanding these things uh, re reflect on that? Well, it's, it's, uh, the Eurozone has certainly complicated the politics of banking. So, for example, I think it would be fair to say that a particular country, let's say France's willingness to recognize and resolve problems in its banking system might be reduced by the presence of the Eurozone and the EU because if it were just up to them and if they weren't part of a broader union, they might face stronger incentives to do something quicker. But the possibility of creating a transfer, effectively, of some of those costs to Germany, I think has created a bit of a temptation to delay uh, dealing with problems. So I think that this is um, an, one element of a longer story, which is that actually the EU and the Eurozone has, because of the, the difficulty of political coordination of dealing with these, these, resolving these problems, has probably delayed the uh, effective responses to them. And the banking union that's recently been announced, do you, do you see that as, uh, how do you see that sitting in with the, with the politics across the different states? It makes sense to have consolidated supervision, that is centralized supervision. It makes sense, but if you're going to have centralized supervision, you have to be able to have intervention. Meaning, if the supervisor says that the bank is lying or that the uh, capital is, is inadequate, that the supervisor can actually do something to force the bank to either come up with that or to uh, close down the bank or to have an infusion of government funds into the bank or something. We call that resolution. So if you're going to be a supervisor, you have to have resolution authority. But if you're going to have resolution authority, you, you also need to have some fiscal resources. And you have, need to have legal authority. Uh, unfortunately, the ECB doesn't have any of that. It doesn't have clear legal resolution authority. And it doesn't have fiscal resources. So right now, the ECB is going to be doing a stress test this year for the European banks. But if you work backwards from the politics, there's no way that the ECB will play the game of political chicken of actually calling out all of the problems in the banking system that it's going to see. And so I will predict that the stress test will deliver a number, ultimately, that will be about 50 to 100 billion euros of capital deficiency of, of needed increase in capital, when the true number might be upwards of four or 500 billion.